Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, last stretch for everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, healthcare interoperability through FIRE. Uh, FIRE, uh, as you can see, is spelled differently here, uh, and it's all about a standard for healthcare uh, exchange of information or data. We'll talk about it during the during the during the session. Uh, for today, I'm going to talk about what is prime therapeutics, what's going on around healthcare, uh, what has been going around healthcare, uh, what is this thing called CMS 9115? It's a mandate. What is fire interoperability man mandate Im impacts to healthcare, and then how did we solve it? Um, so with that, uh, we'll talk about what is prime therapeutics. I'm not sure if everyone knows about Prime Therapeutics. We work in the in the back. Uh, it's a pharmacy benefits manager uh, for health plans as they work in the U.S. Mostly, uh, they contract with employers or individuals. They hire a pharmacy benefits manager to uh, manage their pharmaceutical or pharmacy benefits. So uh, from a bigger picture perspective, Prime helps members get their medicine uh, that they need to feel good. Uh, the key piece here is uh, most folks recognize healthcare providers, sorry, uh, healthcare payers like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or someone uh, of that nature. PBMs kind of work in the background uh, to effectively manage uh, pharmacies or prescriptions, and then uh, for specialty use cases, we also uh, manage the overall health of the member. Uh, we, as I kind of mentioned, we work in the background most, most uh, unless you have to interact with us directly, most organizations or most members do not even know pharmacy uh, benefits management or PBMs are working in the background. Um, so we do collect data, uh, which is used to uh, manage a member's health uh, through analytics and other methods. So what is the state of healthcare data as of uh, right now? I can say right now as of pretty recently. Uh, healthcare data lives in silos. Um, and these are organizational silos. So until recently, most providers kept their data, providers are physicians, kept their data uh, on paper. So Affordable Care Act, which is sometimes called Obama, uh, Obamacare, uh, mandated electronic health records or EMRs uh, or EHRs. Uh, and even with those, today patients have very limited capability to get that data. Now, from a integrated systems perspective, most integration between healthcare organizations has traditionally been through batch files. Uh, these file structures or integration methods utilize uh, pretty old uh, integration methods like telecom methods, X12, things like that. Uh, most pay, patient data or use, you get your EOB or explanation of be benefits through paper records. So uh, the industry has not needed to move uh, to APIs and modern methods uh, by, uh, by any, any means, right? Uh, now, with the advent of personal devices like wearables, IOTs, mobile devices, there is a lot of information which is not being shared across the, across the board. So the patient may have that information for themselves, but the doctor doesn't get access to it or vice versa. There are many things which cannot be utilized together. So uh, CMS, um, uh, it's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, manages your Medicare, Medicaid, HIM, and other, other pieces. I'm throwing out a lot of medical terms, um, so uh, I, I'll try and explain it best uh, during the session, 
but you can definitely ask me questions in the in the questions chat. Uh, so CMS, which is part federal government in the U.S., uh, mandated on May first that anyone dealing with healthcare data has to make things available to APIs. Uh, I'll go into details also as to what is covered and stuff like that, but it, it basically started with all the plans. Those are the plans that in the first paragraph I've kind of explained. Uh, and then it also referred to something called ONC, and I'll explain what they, they talk about, uh, ONC's 21st Century Cures Act. So, and this, this goes into information blocking. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but the key requirements from a payer perspective, so both EMRs, EHRs, doctors, are part of the mandate. They have to share their data. Payers like uh, Blue Process or Prime uh, has to share their data. Labs have to share their, da their data. And it goes into how do patients get access into, uh, into this data and how do they aggregate it and then combine it with other stuff, uh, which is the variables and, and the IoT devices that we have talked about. Uh, it is not that individual organizations were, we were not using IoT devices, uh, but it wasn't shared with the patients. And this is all about patients or individuals. Um, so from a payer perspective, there are three domains that Prime in, in particular has to uh, enable APIs around. Remember, we have about 33 million members. So we have to collect their data and share it through APIs in different organizations. And of course, uh, CMS never took away any of the HIPAA requirements. So we have to, we have to enforce PHI and security to the utmost uh, perspective. Now, um, there is also provider directory data, which is supposed to be, uh, which falls under the payer area. Uh, we have to enable APIs and by the way, this is mandated to be uh, enabled by 1121. With COVID, they gave us about six months of time to uh, enable these things. So they they published everything by May 1st, and then 1121, uh, they want everything running. And I'll talk about how we how we are able or Prime was able to achieve this her Herculean task. Uh, so let's talk about the ONC's uh, uh, 21st Century Act, um, Office of the National Health Care uh, Technology, ONC, that's the federal body, uh, which talks about uh, how do we enable these APIs. So they focused on three things, patients, Doctors and hospitals and payers are, are included in this thing. And then healthcare IT developers. Um, from a patient perspective, what, what is focused here in ONC's mandate is ease of access of their records. We talked about it, how things are not easily available. Protecting the privacy and security, HIPAA applies, PHI applies here. Uh, PHI is uh, patient health information. Um, HIPAA is healthcare, uh, which is again contained in a 2003 law, which is around uh, uh, patient or healthcare information hiding or not sharing widely. Uh, promoting the ability to shop, shop uh, from a patient perspective, shop for care and manage cost. So those are, those are patient centric items that ONC is talking about. From clinicians and hospitals perspective, making patient data requests easy, allowing choices of apps, implementing the APIs and improving patient safety. And then from a API, from uh, health IT providers, uh, there's a condition for certification. So anyone who's developing apps for patients to use uh, will have to go through a certification process and then development of these uh, apps, which can be used by, uh, by patients. So they are basically opening the market uh, for uh, information 
being available for uh, for patients. Uh, the rule also unlocks uh, data from the siloed organizations, and then that, that's contained in a uh, in a information blocking rule or mandate. And it's all about anti-information blocking mandate. Uh, and the the o ONC in their uh, in their mandate uh, clearly talked about fire as the interoperability standard and that is where fire comes in fire is a hl7 um, standard for exchanging data through apis um, it promotes healthcare technology um, it was first it was it's been in the industry for over 30 years uh, it was first adopted by emrs ehr especially uh, large hospital groups or large groups where they needed to exchange information. Uh, it, it is an international standards. There are uh, domains which work on individual country global. So Canada has a domain, Europe has a domain, and they work independently being specific to certain sectors of the, uh, of, of the global, uh, of the work. Uh, it's a machine readable uh, standard. Uh, there are several bodies within HL7 FIRE in the US who are working on particular use cases. So US Core, which is an HL7 core uh, body, Da Vinci and Karen are focus groups who are working on different domains. To give you an example, uh, some work on the claim domain, some work on uh, a larger domain from a uh, formulary perspective or drug perspective, things like that. Uh, what FIRE does is uh, it is a RESTful level two maturity model compliant. Uh, so it was built from ground up to meet the HL7 standards, which is a healthcare da data exchange standard and it's a data model, but it then twists it to be RESTful API compliant. So quite a lot of uh, information which is in the model doesn't need to be in the RESTful API model. And there are uh, structures within the model to help you implement those things. Uh, then it normalizes terminologies. If you think about uh, healthcare, there are many terminologies which are which physicians use, technicians use. Uh, it's a huge industry, so it normalizes to a standard terminology or taxonomy standard. Rx norm is one of them. SNOMAD, ICD, LOINC, and others. It is uh, a security compliant, so it is OA 2.0 compliant. Uh, so it takes care of security by its nature also. And I'll talk about how we put layers on top of it with WSO2 to make sure uh, we are adhering to HIPAA and PHI. Um, it, it allows the industry to create a common standard to exchange information. So HL7 by its nature has been used to exchange information, especially with the federal government for quite a long time. Uh, so for instance, your COVID data is being exchanged with the CDC using HL7 uh, V2 or V3, depends on the, the structure. Uh, encourages reuse, so uh, self-explanatory, uh, conforms to a uh, uh, industry standard, and it is, as I kind of explained, uh, to HIPAA standards. Uh, Prime is part of uh, a of the HL7 governing body uh, alongside uh, of uh, large digital di giants like Apple, Amazon, Google, some other healthcare plans like Blue Cross uh, and some private plans. So this is where ONC is kind of moving towards the, their uh, Office of the National Coordinator of Health ONC. Um, 
their idea or their roadmap is to have a very connected healthcare system where uh, information is exchanged in a secure and uh, transparent method, not hiding any data or blocking any data. And in their model, patient is at the center. So quite a lot of information is being shared with the patient to make them in charge of control of their healthcare from a cost to decision-making uh, perspective. If you go to your PCP or primary care provider and you want a second opinion, you do not need to go in to the second opinion body and ask to repeat the test. You can share the same test and can get the same second opinion in a Jiffy. In fact, with virtual healthcare, that can be done within within uh, hours rather than the months that it was uh, it was taking. Uh, within the roadmap, there are two new pieces which may be coming in the near future. So where does healthcare go or where, where does health IT go in particular? So smart or substitutable medical applications and technology is one sector which is defining standards for mostly uh, mobile apps. So this is where the, the digital companies like Amazon's and Google's and, and Apple's are coming in and saying, hey, let's figure out a way to exchange data for from many different organizations so that the mobile phone becomes the center for a decision-making uh, perspective for a patient. And then from a healthcare organization perspective, how do they exchange data when a physician is trying to make uh, decisions? And that's where CDS hooks will come in into, uh, into play. Uh, emerging technology, smart is more, re more emerging uh, than uh, and has been worked on more than CDS hooks. CDS hooks, definitely quite a lot of EMRs and EHRs have kind of worked on it. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, when a doctor prescribes a medicine, they don't even know at that point that if it's part of their, what we call the formatory, which is the list of uh, medicines which a plan would cover. So now a patient now goes in into a pharmacy and they might have to pay the full prescript, full retail price, uh, which now becomes an exchange between the pharmacist and the doctor and they might change it uh, if the patient asks for it. So those kind of things have been uh, released from uh, happening by the CMS rules and these CDS hooks can now connect into a doctor's office and say, hey, this, this, this medicine is not part of the, your plan. Can these other medications or alternatives be part of, uh, can you prescribe those? Uh, I've put in some uh, links to documentation, sandbox, and um, um, CDS hooks, uh, GitHub libraries that you can use uh, at a later time. So how is Prime standing up interoperability? And mind you, this well, from within seven months, we will be able to stand up these, these APIs. So we play in definitely the claim uh, area, which is uh, when you go uh, through your provider, through your uh, payer to uh, buy a medicine, we pay part of it, you pay part of it. Those are considered claim. That data needs to be shared with the patient from a historical perspective. That is definitely part of the, um, part of the mandate. Then we need to tell you, uh, the patient, what is covered. And this has to be an API. And then what are in-network pharmacies? So if you're in the US, in-network and out-of-network is a big thing, which allows quite a lot of people to uh, achieve some uh, uh, discounts offered by payers or blues or private payers. So, these APIs from scratch, we will be standing up within seven months. And I'll talk about the journey Prime has gone through uh, to be able to deliver these APIs within seven months. 
So where did we start from? Uh, we struggled like more, most organizations. We were a point-to-point -point application integration organization. Um, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of applications did point-to-point -point integrations. There was no organizations around it. There were operational struggles. Uh, quite a lot of these applications individually managed everything from front end to middle layer and the back end. Uh, there was no reuse. I, uh, these were unique implementations of each application. Uh, there were security gaps. And then these were gro growth deterred. So anytime a new feature needed to be added to the, to the, to the application, uh, it took a lot of work. Um, so we decided, Prime decided to do a capability uplift and we created a project for, for that capability uplift and it focused on people process technology. Uh, Asanka mentioned these things today. Uh, it is in line what we did six years ago. Uh, we seeded the project with the right people, trained them in the right architecture and technology and then use them to spread the knowledge, uh, decided on the process. We, we talked about a knowledge center, an integration competency center, define the charter, define the patterns, assign people, and then finding the right technology to purchase and then bring it forward. So I'll talk about some of these layers, how we decided on these things uh, in my next slide. So where we lived, so Security Gateway Prime being a a, uh, a, 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 a controlled organization mandated that we have security at our top most layer. So we do definitely uh, utilize a security gateway, uh, which is uh, highly uh, controlled uh, and it cannot be um, touched or changed without the right people having access to them. Uh, so we went from a highly desensitized security gateway to highly sensitized gate security gateway with the proper release management schedule and controls over uh, our security gateway. We are using Form Sentry uh, for our security gateway. Uh, from an integration and API gateway perspective, uh, again, as I mentioned, we were very uh, um, distributed or broken up. Uh, with the update, we brought in WSO2 as our uh, API manager, then utilize um, different uh, endpoints to implement business logic or data logic. And as you can see, uh, we do have uh, ESBs and uh, Tomcat, um, even IBM Vest here at that time, these were about five, six years ago. Uh, and we bought everything from WSO2. This is our footprint, what it looks like uh, at that time when we bought it. Uh, we have let go of some of the things like the application server, because uh, we do have microservices now and EI has taken over enterprise uh, services bus and some of the uh, app server pieces. We did also bring in a application performance management system, which allowed us to have visibility into our services through and through. Uh, as I kind of mentioned, we have a security gateway, we then have WSO2, and then we, have visi we need visibility into our data layer. And all these needed to be synchronized through a application performance management system. So our developers could view, envision, and fix things uh, as needed. This was our first uh, phase where we defined and designed uh, our integration competency. The next was process uplift. This is the next phase where we defined, brought in CICD and an integration competency center. We talked about the process and this kind of addresses some of the process situations. Uh, I, I'm quoting Gartner here, and they recommended that we bring in an ICC. From an enterprise perspective, it helps uh, expedite quite a lot of uh, 
growth within an organization. So what does ICC do? Um, it defines the process. Uh, it defines um, the, the SOA guidelines, um, the integration uh, information patterns, sorry, integration, enterprise integration patterns, uh, best practices, standardizes the architecture. It also does governance and then any improvements. What we did was not just patterns, uh, we also define implementations. So uh, mock implementations, stubbed out implementations were part of it to uh, kickstart some of the development that needed to happen within different groups at Prime. We define uh, our CICD pipeline. I joke about it, that's it's continuous integration and control deployments. Prime is a regulated industry, therefore our production deployments need to be managed and uh, uh, documented. Uh, with WSO2's help, we, we define Ansible scripts and our Jenkins pipes to create a CICD pipeline. Uh, then the next phase was uh, our standardized APIs. So up till now, Prime was doing very custom use case APIs, uh, either internal or external. Uh, then as we started maturing, and this is our third phase, we talked about healthcare, HL7, uh, and how can we standardize APIs where we built once and reused many. So that's the pattern we applied, and that's the uh, concept which we brought forward with a few five APIs in particular in 2018-19 timeframe. It, it allowed us to meet our clients' demands around mobile apps, uh, portals, uh, and making sure to take you back to what a PBM is. Uh, from a client perspective, we sit behind our blues. Uh, they are the ones who sell the product, that's what a patient would sign up for. Uh, and PBM is, is not uh, in the forefront. Uh, and as we enable these APIs, it's a, it's a joint solution or it's an integrated solution from a mobile portal perspective for our uh, blues to make sure uh, your member, our member can see everything on a single system uh, and they do not have to go to another environment or another portal to get their pharmacy data. So all these combined, we enable these APIs. Uh, these are uh, cloud scale APIs. So we, we did adhere to, to the 12 factor uh, and making sure that some of these uh, APIs can scale up. We published these or we, we released these APIs at in end of 2019 and 2020 is where we uh, where we hit uh, CMS 20 uh, CMS 9115, which is how we are able to deliver those APIs within seven months. Uh, we also did a security uplift in 2019. Uh, we we partnered with WSO2 to help us implement dynamic tokens with OS. O, o, or two grants, which included, uh, which improved our security. And then there is a project right now going on where we are going to be using um, OpenID Connect with um, decision and policies and IDP federations um, so that we can adhere to what ONC and CMS is asking for uh, and in their, in their ask. They are very specific to OA2 and ID, uh, uh, Open ID Connect. Prime has partnered with WSO2 to stand up a vertical around healthcare. Uh, we are part of the Healthcare Vertical Advisory Council. And within that, we've, we've kind of worked with WSO2 to stand up a uh, w, WSO2 Open Healthcare platform, which I am, uh, which Nirmal is going to talk about next. <laughs>